Laboratory Safety Training. This is for General Chemistry Lab at the University of Pittsburgh Department of Chemistry. You might be thinking, why do, should I have to go through safety training if I'm doing a web-based lab course and not handling chemicals? Well, there's a couple of reasons for this. The first is, although you might not be doing a web you might be doing a web-based lab course now, you probably won't be in the near future. We want to make sure at the, in, at the chemistry department at Pitt that we, there's a continuity in training for safety. In general, chemistry is a, a very important start in our safety training and to prepare you for chem labs that you'll take in the future. The other reason is that safety in Performing, chemist performing chemistry experiments in lab are, go hand in hand. All chemicals, laboratory protocols, and lab equipment have some sort of hazard or risk associated with them. It is important that we're familiar with them and know how to minimize the risk of an accident occurring. We do that by, by following certain safety procedures. Ordinarily, for general chemistry, we go through safety training during the first week of class, where we go through a lime green safety contract and show students different um, important areas of the lab where we can deal with things like chemicals in the eye or, or spills that occur. Instead of going through the lime green safety sheet, we're going to go through this presentation based on it. This presentation as the lime green safety sheet is actually organized in three different sections. The first section deals with dress code and behavior in, within the laboratory. The second part goes through cautious handling of chemicals and laboratory equipment. And the third part talks about emergency or accident response. Let's go on to the first part, where we talk about dress code. What you wear when you come into the lab is a very important part of what keeps you safe. And what you wear when you come into the lab keeps you safe because it provides an extra barrier between your skin and the chemicals that we use in lab. So, appropriate dress in lab starts with making sure that those vulner your, your skin, which is very vulnerable to um, damage through chem by chemicals, are covered. So, in the chemistry lab, you want to make sure that you're wearing pants that completely cover your legs and shirts that completely cover your torsos, torso. You don't want to wear shorts or any other pants that that shorts or any other pants that do not cover your legs or shirts that do not cover your torso. You also want to make sure that you wear footwear that completely cover your feet. You don't want to wear shoes such as clogged sandals or any other types of pumps or flats that do not cover your toes, the tops of your feet, and the back of your feet. Another thing you want to make sure that you do is tie back long hair so that it doesn't come into contact with either chemicals or open flames. And in general chemistry, we do use quite a bit of open flame in the form of Bunsen burners or Fisher burners. We also, you also do not want to wear contact lenses in the lab as they interact with different organic solvents that we might be using in certain experiments and cause them to be fused to your eye. It is probably a very good idea to wear your eyeglasses for lab. Another important barrier that, that we use um, to protect your skin and other parts of your body from, from chemical exposure is what we call personal protective equipment or PPE. In general chemistry lab, there are three types of PPE that we use. The most common and, and, the most, and probably the most important is using chemical splash goggles. At the University of Pittsburgh, we have to wear chemical splash goggles in our, in our, in our teaching labs. 
You can't wear safety glasses or any other type of goggle that doesn't that doesn't completely and snugly fit on your face. Another important barrier between your skin and the chemicals that we use is a lab coat. Lab coat coats could provide complete very good protection and an extra layer between your skin and, and the chemicals that are used in lab. At the University of Pittsburgh, we require flame resistant lab coats that are usually that can usually be purchased either at the Pitt bookstore or online. Of course, for this web-based class, you do not need to buy either chemical splash goggles or a flame resistant lab coat, but you may need them for future courses where we do in-person labs. Another piece of PPE that you might see myself, who will be doing many of the lab experiments, wearing are, are gloves. Gloves, at least for general chemistry lab, are especially used when we work, we work with corrosive chemicals or toxic chemicals, and typically when we use any type of organic solvent. You might see in some cases that I don't wear gloves, and that's because the wearing gloves is not part of what will keep me safe for the lab. A very good example is I probably won't wear nitrile gloves when I'm using a Bunsen burner, um, mainly because that provides another hazard since the gloves are probably a little flammable and might cause another injury to me. But you might in some cases see me wear gloves when I'm working with strong acids or bases or other toxic chemicals. The other part of the first part of the safety contract deals with how you behave in a lab. So what types of things do you bring in the lab or not bring in the lab? And how do you move around the lab to prevent accidents? So the first one is probably pretty obvious. No food or drink are allowed in the lab. This also includes tobacco products and chewing gum. Since these things can be contaminated, can become contaminated with chemicals, finding a not finding an easy entryway into your body through ingestion or through breathing. It is also very important that you move around the laboratory carefully to prevent accidents. Walk slowly and carefully and do not run around the laboratory. It is also important that you do not do anything to startle a lab mate while they're working as this can, as this can cause the person to have an accident. It is also very important that you do not touch chemicals with your bare hands. Always use a scupula or spatula to obtain any solid reagent and a beaker to re obtain a liquid reagent. This is true even if you wear gloves or even if the reagent doesn't seem like something that you should have to use a spatula for. For example, metal strips such as zinc or copper. This is the end of part A, guys. Now we're going to move on to part B and look at reagent handling. How do we handle reagents in a laboratory? Probably the first important thing that we want to assume is, or to keep in mind, is that there are different hazards associated with reagents that we work with. These hazards are listed at the beginning of each experiment. Here are some common ones that you'll see. What I'm going to show you are what we call the Global Harmonized System, or GHS pictograms. These are internationally and universally recognized pictograms for certain hazards associated with chemicals. One of the first um, pictograms that we'll show here is for flammable chemicals. We want to assume that all organic chemicals that we use in, in lab are flammable. This means we don't want to use them around a heat source or open flame. The second common hazard are corrosives that may be corrosive to the equipment that they're used with or with when they become in contact with your skin. Acids and bases tend to be corrosive chemicals. And these are chemicals, for example, that you might want to wear gloves while handling. 
Another hazard that we might see are chemicals that are acutely toxic or poisonous. This is represented by the skull and crossbones pictogram. These are also chemicals that we might want to wear gloves while handling. The final pictogram is for environmental hazards. These are, these are chemicals that when, when are put into the water stream can be dangerous to aquatic life or, or other forms of plant and animal life. The next part is deals with looking at deal, working with reagents. It is very important, as we said before, to not touch any chemical reagent. You want to use a spatula or scupula to transfer any solid, or for any liquid reagent, we want to pour into an acceptable acceptable container. We want to make sure in that case that we match the the task to the the, the, the container to the task. For example, we would not want to pour from a, a gallon reagent bottle into a skinny 10 milliliter graduated cylinder because that graduated cylinder can tip over. We instead would want to use a, something like a beaker, which is harder to tip over and safer to use. In this way, we actually prevent an accident from occurring. It is also important that when we're handling reagents that, that we don't remove them from the laboratory with, without, without permission. When we store chemicals, we'll usually use a secondary containment system, such as a bin or a bucket, to make sure that if a chemical spills, it spills into a container where its cleanup is easy. It is also very important that we make sure that chemicals do not become contaminated. The best way to do that is to make sure that when we get chemicals out of a container, that if we get extra, we do not put the, that extra back into the container. That extra reagent is now considered to be waste and should be disposed of properly. We also want to make sure that when we obtain what we need, we put stoppers, lids, and caps back onto the reagent bottles. Finally, when we're done with our doing our experiment for the day, we'll have a lot of waste that we need to dispose of. Some waste can be safely flushed down the drain with plenty of running water, but other types of waste might need to be connect might need to be collected. Your instruction your instructor, your laboratory instructor will tell you how to dispose of your chemicals at the end of the day either in specially labeled waste bottles as seen in the picture or by flushing them down the drain. Never assume that all reagents can be flushed down the drain. You'll also work with a lot of different laboratory equipment. One thing to make sure that you look out for is broken equipment. Probably the most common types of equipment that you use in a chemistry lab are different types of glassware, such as beakers, flasks, test tubes, and graduated cylinders. When you first look in your lab locker, you want to make sure that, all, that none of your glassware has any cracks or chips in them. If they do, they cannot be used to do chemical experiments and must be disposed of properly. This usually comes in the form of putting them in a glass waste box, which can be found in, in the lab. Talk to your lab instructor about how to dispose of the, that glassware if you're not sure. Another thing that you'll want to look for are things like frays and wires for hot plates, centrifuges, or other types of electrical equipment that you might use. Or cracks in tubing for Bunsen burners. These also pose safety hazards and should be brought to the attention of your lab instructor so that they can be fixed. Do not use equipment that is broken or damaged. Another important thing 
to remember is to never force any thermometer or glass rod into a stopper or other small hole. This can cause the, the glass rod or thermometer to break and can cause a puncture wound. If you do need to put a thermometer or glass rod through a stopper, you do want to make sure that you talk to your laboratory instructor about how to safely do this. And wear protective equipment such as gloves when handling these types of tasks. Finally, probably the most important safety rule to, to abide by is keeping your work area cleaned. If any chemical spills on your, in your work area, it is important to consult with your instructor about, to, about how to safely clean that up. Small spills can be wiped up with paper towels, probably be wiped up with paper towels. However, large scale spills or spills that are on the floor definitely will need extra care and you need to work with your instructor on how to clean those things up. Keeping things clean is probably one of the most important ways that we can keep things safe because it minimizes the likelihood of chemical exposure. This brings us to our last part, looking at accidents. The common, chemi the common accidents that occur in a general chemistry lab, I usually think of three of them. The first is cuts and scrapes caused by broken glassware or other sharp, sharp objects, which should, be, which should be cleaned and covered with a bandage. The second thing is, the second hazard are spills. Spills that either occur on the floor or on the workbench, or spills that, that occur, that, that spill on a student or instructor's skin. Those types of spills need special care in handling, and we'll talk about how to handle some of those things here. The third type of injury that typically happens in the general chemistry lab might not have to do with the chemistry going on at all, and that is fainting. Sometimes students faint because they don't have, they haven't eaten all day, or sometimes they get overwhelmed by the, by the smells in the chemistry lab. In either case, all these, all these accidents have to be handled, and we do have a protocol for handling them. So let's take a look at some of those protocols. One of the most serious injuries that wearing goggles are supposed to actually prevent are eye injuries. In a chemistry lab, eye injuries are always treated as very serious injuries. And our response for eye injuries is to get the person to the nearest eye wash station and flush the eye for 15 to 20 minutes while forcing it open. In our chemistry lab, in our general chemistry labs, we have two eye washes at the sink closest to the exits. Our eye wash stations also double as drench hoses. To use the eye wash station, you and another you simply pull out the hose and turn it on. Water comes out that's at a temperature that's comfortable for for rinsing and at a flow rate that is also that not only is comfortable but gets the chemical out, out of your eye. Again, you should use the eye wash for 15 to 20 minutes while having your eye forced open. So this is a two-person job where your lab partner or lab instructor will help you. Some eye wash stations in the chemistry building are also found in the hallways. So how about chemistry, chemical spills? Again, if a chemical gets on the work it, or if a spill occurs on the workbench or on the floor, it is very important that you tell your instructor who will help you to clean up the spill. This might be as simple as mopping it up with a chemical absorbent pad or a paper towel to using special, a specialized spill kit to isolate, surround, and clean up the spill. However, if you get chemicals on your 
on, on yourself, then there's a few things that we need to do to make sure that you're safe. The first is to remove the affected clothing, which can cause more chemicals to, to soak into your skin. This is no time for modesty, although we'll try to preserve your modesty as much as possible. The most important thing is to get that chemical away from your skin. The second thing we'll want to do is rinse off your skin. For a small spill, such as just getting some a little acid on your hand, we might ask you to just run it to just hold it under running running water for about 15 to 20 minutes. For a larger scale spill, we might, such as something spilling on your arm, we might ask you to use the drench hose. Our eye wash stations actually double as drench hoses. Again, you'll flush that skin after removing the affected clothing for 15 to 20 minutes. If there's a large scale spill, such as a spill happening getting on your legs or on a large part of your torso or body, you'll need to use a safety shower. In our building, the safety showers are located in the hallway. Again, you'll be under the safety shower for 15 to 20 minutes. After we treat you immediately, get, take care of your, the immediate need to get the chemical off, there are a couple of things that will also happen. One thing that will happen is that we'll file an incident report. Incident reports are not just limited to when an accident occurs. Incident, sp incident reports can be filled out if we have a large scale spill on the floor. You'll fill this out with your lab instructor as soon as you're able. Again, the most important thing is to make sure that you're safe. We'll take care of the incident report as soon as, as, soon as we can afterwards. If an incident requ does require you to seek medical attention, there are two places that you can go. For less serious injuries or, or accidents, you'll probably go to the University Student Health Center lo located in Nordenburg Hall. For other injuries that require emergency response, you'll You'll probably, you will be taken to UPMC Presbyterian Hospital, which is located in Oakland, just a few blocks away. One thing to note is that it's really important that you have personal insurance coverage. Because in most cases, treatment will be um, paying for treatment will be your responsibility. Another thing to look out for are different building alarms. Since we do work in a chemistry building, oftentimes there, there are times when a fire alarm will sound or, or another alarm that requires us to exit the building. If this occurs, it's important that you turn off all electrical equipment and all heating sources, such as Bunsen burners and heating um, and heating plate hot plates, it proceeds to the nearest exit by direction of your laboratory instructor. It is also important that you do not use the elevators when this occurs. When you exit the building, your instructor might set a meeting place for you to, to for you to go to just so that they can make sure that everyone is out of the building. In some cases, you may be able to take your personal belongings, but in other cases, it might be important that you leave the building as quickly as possible. Finally, if you have a disability or any other condition that might be affected by, by you doing lab, it is important that you let your lab instructor know and you, and you talk to the General, the laboratory coordinator, which is me, Dr. Madison. Okay, guys, this concludes this concludes safety training. Um, you're going to have a couple of 
questions to answer about this video, so you probably want to take a look at those. And um, look forward to working with you guys this summer.